Hey there, Sam. Writing software is hard. Maintaining and making sure that our software is working is even harder. And that's exactly the reason on why we always want to test our code before shipping it. When it comes to testing, there are generally a few ways to achieve this. And there are manual testing, unit testing, feature testing, and end-to-end -end testing, or E2E for short. Manual testing is the one that we're most familiar with. That involves the developer to physically go through the code and check if they're working. On the other hand, the other three in this list are considered as automated testing. And that's where the developer would write a script to test the functions or features in an app. As long as the test cases in this script has passed, we will know that our app is working. The main benefit of automated testing is that we can quickly test our code with minimal human input. And it will really shine if we are building a large app. So the idea is, every time if we add a new feature or functions to our code, we would run the automated testing script and as long as the script passes, we can be sure that the newly added code is not breaking our code. And this is very, very useful because we no longer need to go back and manually redo the test for all the functions and features that we have written before. Now let's talk more about the differences between unit testing, feature testing, and end-to-end -end testing. Unit testing, as its name suggests, is testing done on the smallest possible unit in an app. And the smallest possible unit in an app is normally a function. In other words, you can think of an app is made out of a lot of small functions that work together to deliver a feature. So the idea of unit testing is to write a test for all the functions in our app. If all the tests passed, that means all the building block of our app is working. So our app as a whole should work, right? Well, not really. That is not necessarily true. Here's a few examples on what could go wrong when we solely rely on unit testing. They are sad, but true. Unit test is meant to be fast to execute, but not necessarily reliable. In contrast, feature testing is the notion of testing a feature in an app. Feature testing is a higher level approach compared to unit testing. It focuses more on the feature rather than making sure that each function in our app is working. And that makes it a more reliable test compared to unit testing. For example, suppose we are testing for the post creation feature in our app. In the case of unit testing, we would test for something like, can we insert the title for the post? Or can we insert the body for the post? Does it accept a string, a number, or an array? Are we expecting an exception when we give it a different data type and other smaller functions that build up the post creation logic? Now for feature testing, we'll be looking at different things. We will only care about if an operation will actually create a record in our database. So if we were to run the post creation logic, in feature testing, we'll go ahead and fetch the newly created record in our database and verify it and see if the title and the body were inserted correctly. End-to-end -end testing is the highest up in the food chain. It's on an even higher level than feature testing. In a nutshell, end-to-end -end testing would actually mock the user interaction and test our app as it mimics an actual user. For example, if we were to test our post creation logic, an end-to-end -end testing will be a script that actually tries to visit the web page in our app that creates a post. The program will attempt to submit the form on behalf of the user and validate the result to see if it's actually working. And similar to feature testing, end-to-end -end testing doesn't care about the individual functions in our app. Instead, it will put a lot of emphasis on the output of the app, which in our example that we just discussed, it will test if the form that we use to create the post is working correctly. End-to-end -end testing is highly reliable, but very hard to implement. Now, in terms of reliability, manual testing has questionable reliability because it really depends on how well the tester understands how the program works, and also under the assumption that the tester did not overlook a certain feature in the app. Unit testing is not that reliable compared to the other method, and it is because even though you can make sure that every single function in our app is working perfectly, there is simply no guarantee that they will work well together as a group. In comparison, feature testing is much more reliable because it ensures that a feature is doing what it's supposed to be doing. End-to-end -end testing has the highest reliability among them all because it is directly mocking the end user's behavior. In terms of speed, manual testing is very, very, very slow. And the reason is, as we discussed earlier, every time we introduce a new feature, we need to go back and retest all the features that we have done so far in order to make sure the new feature does not break our code. Unit testing is fast because it is testing small functions in our app and they are very lightweight. Feature testing is slower than unit testing 
because they usually involve database operations or a group of functions running together. End-to-end -to -end testing is the slowest among all because mimicking a user is very time-consuming and delicate. End-to-end -end testing is more relevant in front-end development, and it won't be our focus in building an API server. In the upcoming videos, we'll dive deeper into writing unit tests and feature tests in Laravel. I'll see you there. Key takeaway for this lesson, unit testing is the notion of testing the smallest units or building blocks in our app. In other words, functions. If the basic building blocks are working, then the app should work, although this is not necessarily true. Feature testing focuses on the feature and the outcome rather than the individual functions in our app. It is more reliable than unit testing, but slower. End-to-end -end testing mocks the end user's behavior and has the highest reliability among all. However, end-to-end -end testing is very hard to implement and very slow. That's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. Hey there, Sam. The test folder in our Laravel project contains everything about testing. Laravel uses PHP unit as its main testing library out of the box. The first thing that we want to look at is the PHP unit XML file. This is where we set up the configuration for our PHP unit test. Now, if you haven't worked with PHP unit before, this file might look a little bit scary to you. Let's quickly go through the key points here. First of all, we see the test suite group here. A test suite means that a group of tests are supposed to run together. So here we can see that Laravel is grouping the unit test in the unit directory as a test suite and also all the feature tests. The suffix attribute is telling PHP unit that we only want to scan files that ends with test.php. Other files will not be included in the test suite. Coverage is the code coverage configuration. And by setting up this configuration, we can tell PHP unit to generate a nice code coverage report for us. The server elements here are the environmental variables that we would pass to the testing environment. By default, Laravel uses the default database connection as defined in a database configuration file, which in our case will be our MySQL database connection. You are free to set up your own database connection by uncommenting these two lines out and supply your own value. Okay, now, once we configure the PHP unit XML file, the next thing I want to talk about is the structure of the test folder. You'll notice that there are already two files created in it, the create application file and the test case file. In a nutshell, the test case file is an abstract class that set up our test. The test case class is meant to be extended by every single test in our app. The test case class bootstraps and provides us a lot of helper functions for us to write our test code. Now you notice that the test case class is using a correct application trait. Let's look at what's inside it. It is a simple trait that contains exactly one method that returns an app instance. This is a very important function because it provides us a mock app instance to the testing environment and it is used internally by the base test case class. You are free to modify this trait if you want to provide more features to the app instance or customize how the app instance was instantiated. Anyway, let's see how we can create our first test in Laravel. The easiest way to get started is to use the PHP Addison command. We'll go to our terminal and type in PHP Addison make test and supply the help flag to read the documentation. And in here, we notice that if we pass an additional unit flag to it, we'll create a unit test. By default, if we use the command as it is, Laravel will create a feature test. Let's try it out. I want to test our post repository functions. So I'll type out PHP Addison, make test, double dash unit, and the name of the test will be post repository test. And now if we go back to our folder, you'll notice that Laravel has created a new file in a unit directory. And if you look inside it, it is a simple class with one method in it, which is a test example on how we can write our unit test. All right, let's start writing our test for the post repository. When writing a test, it is important for us to be aware of what we are testing. In our post repository, we have three methods, the create method, update method, and delete method. So we're gonna write a test for each of them. As a convention, we use snake case to name the method for our test functions. And we always prefix them with the word test. That way, PHP unit can automatically recognize the test function and execute the test later on. So I'll create three methods in our test class, test create, test update, and test delete. And now, here's the question. How do we get started on writing tests? Here are the general steps that I usually take when writing a test. The first step is to define our goal. In other words, what's the purpose of this function? And what do we want to test? In our case here, we want to make sure that a post can be created by using the create method in a post repository. 
The second step is to replicate the environment or apply any restriction if available. What this means is to recreate the condition on where we would code the correct method in our post repository. In our example here, there's not much to do to replicate the environment or apply restrictions actually, but if we look at some other cases, for example, an e-commerce app, like testing the shopping cart, the environment will be much more complicated to replicate. To test the checkout function in an e-commerce app, we first need to log in a user and get a user to add a bunch of items to their shopping cart. And that's exactly what I meant by replicating the environment. The third step is to define a source of truth. The source of truth is another word for the result expected. So here, if we're going to create a post, we will expect a post created in a database to have a title and body to be exactly the same as what we have passed on to the correct method of our post repository. Once we have defined a source of truth, we'll compare the result. And comparing the result means to run a function that we're testing and compare the result return against the source of truth. Okay, let's get started on writing the test code for our post repository. So step one, our goal is to test if the correct method in our post repository will indeed create a record in the database. For step two, the only requirement for the environment is to have access to an instance of the repository. So I'll go ahead and create an instance of the repository from the service container. To do that, we'll need to have access to an app instance. And by default, unit test is extending the test case class provided by PHP unit. It is not using the base test case class provided by Laravel. So we're losing out on a lot of goodies. So let's refactor our code to extend our test class from the test case provided by Laravel. The reason why Laravel has opted in to use the test case provided by PHP unit is because unit testing is meant to be lightweight. The test case class provided by Laravel is an enhanced version of the PHP unit test case and therefore much heavier than the original. However, don't let this rule restrict you from doing what you're doing. The more important point here is to write our test properly. So once we loaded the test case provided by Laravel, we have access to the app instance from the this keyword. So to create an instance of the post repository, all we need to do is to call the make function from it. For the source of truth, I'll define a payload for the post that we're going to create. And now everything is ready, and we'll call the correct method from our repository and compare the results. Now the result variable should be an instance of the created post model. We need to make sure it has exactly the same title as our payload. To do that, we can call one of the assert methods. The one we're looking for is called assert same which will compare two values using the triple equal sign. The first argument is what is expected, which in our case here will be the title property in our payload array. And the second argument is what we actually get, which will be the title attribute that we read from the created model. The third argument optionally accepts an error message that will get PHP unit to display for us in case this assertion has failed. It's a good idea to always include this message as it provides more context on why did the assertion fail. Okay, now let's try to run our test. We need to run a PHP unit binary, which is located inside the vendor folder and the bean folder. We'll hit enter and our tests are executed successfully. We get two risky tests because we haven't implemented the test update and test delete methods. I'll show it to you how would it look like if our test has failed. So I'll go back to our test correct method and change the expected argument to something else. We'll run PHP unit again. And this time we see an error with our custom error message. As you can see here, the custom error message really helps out on telling us why did our test fail by providing a context. If we put down a very descriptive error message, it can really help us to debug our code. All right, back to our test class. Let's continue to write a test for the update method and the delete method. Again, we're gonna follow the four step process. First thing first, define a goal. For the update method, we want to make sure that we can update a post using the update method. Step two, replicate the environment. In this case, we want an instance of repository and also having an existing post in our database. So I'll use the post factory to create a dummy post. The third step is to define a source of truth in which I'll create a payload to update our dummy post. I'll change the title to ABC123. Step four, we'll execute our code and compare the result. So I'll call the update method on our post repository 
and the assert same method again to compare the payload title against the updated post title. Let's run our test once again. Whoops, we get an error. And it seems like the error is because our post factory is returning a collection rather than a model instance. To resolve this, I'll simply grab the first element from the result of the create method and run PHP unit again. And bam, this time our test is passing. Great. Lastly, let's finish off our delete test method before we end the lesson. Again, the same thing here. We'll define a goal, which is to test the delete method in our repository and see if it is working. For the environment, we need an instance of our repository and also a dummy record in our database. Again, we'll use the factory function to create a record. We don't have any source of truth, so we can just skip to step 4, which is to compare the result. I'll call the false delete method on our repository, and we'll verify if our record is indeed deleted by finding the record in our database. We shouldn't find any record at this point, so the expected result is now. Let's run PHP unit. Whoops, I made a mistake. The result returned by our repository is a boolean and we shouldn't read the ID property from it. So I'll just change it to dummy instead. Let's try again. And we see all of our tests passed. Beautiful. We still need to write tests for our user repository and comment repository. I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Again, I'll share my solution in the project git repository. So feel free to check it out if you're stuck. Now, I do want to talk about one last thing before we end the lesson. The tests that we have written so far are considered as test on the happy path. What I mean by that is, this test only tests for the behavior when we use this function correctly. You see, everything can go wrong in a live production environment. For example, there might be a situation where the user will try to delete a post that has already been deleted. If that's the case, how do we handle that scenario? Will there be an exception? Will that exception be handled correctly? Would it break our code? To answer these questions, it is very important for us to also test these abnormal behaviors, which is also known as a sad path in testing. Typically, we will have more sad path than happy path. The more sad path that you can capture, the less likely that your code will break in production. However, it's important to note that it's impossible to handle 100% of the edge cases. The important thing is to find a good balance between finding the edge cases and the likelihood of these events from happening. Okay, let's quickly write a sad path when we try to delete a post that doesn't exist in the database. I'll create a new test function, which will test if an exception will be thrown when we try to delete a post that does not exist. The environment will be similar to our happy path test delete, so I'll just copy and paste from there and change factory create to factory make because we don't want the record to exist inside our database. And now, if we try to delete our dummy record, we will expect an error because based on what is written in our post repository, when a repository failed to delete a model, it will throw a general JSON exception. And to handle this behavior, back in our test function, we should call the expect exception helper method to tell PHP unit that there should be an exception. And now let's run PHP unit again, and we get green. Beautiful. And that is pretty much it. Try and see how many edge cases that you can come up with and write a test for each of them. We'll continue and talk more about testing in the next video. I'll see you there. Key takeaway for this lesson, Laravel uses PHP unit as its official testing library. Laravel provides a test case class, which is basically an enhanced version of the test case provided by PHP unit. Laravel's test case loads a lot of helper methods for us to use in a Laravel app. We should write tests on both happy path and sad path for our functions. That's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. Hey there, SM. Let's test our API routes in this lesson. As we mentioned before in a previous lesson, feature testing are tests written against features in our app. In other words, we are testing if a group of functions are working correctly together. And we emphasize more on the outcome rather than the individual functions. Testing our API endpoints can be considered as feature testing. Because an API endpoint normally involves multiple functions working together. All right, let's go ahead and create a new folder in our feature testing directory. I'll call it API, and we'll put all the tests that's related to API in this folder. And we'll also create a v1 folder 
for our version 1 API endpoints, as we mentioned in a previous lesson. And again, if you think that your project doesn't need this v1 folder, you can just get rid of it. And now we'll start with our post API endpoint. So I'll create a new folder called post and we'll create a test class in it. We'll go to our terminal and type in PHP Addison make test. And I'll call our test class post API test. And I'll put a newly generated file inside our post folder and refactor the namespace according to our folder structure so that our IDE will stop complaining. And now our post resource has five endpoints for us to test. The index, show, create, update, and delete endpoint. And we're going to write a test for each of them. Let's start with the index endpoint. I'll call the test function test index. And inside the function body, we're going to follow our testing rules again. First of all, we need to set up the environment. In our case here, we need some pre-existing data in our database before we can test this endpoint. So our first task here is to load some data in the database. Once we load the data, we need to make a HTTP request to call the index endpoint and assert the status on the HTTP response to make sure that it's returning a 200 status code. And we also want to verify the records returned from the HTTP response to see if they're matching our database records. All right, let's load some data in our database. We can call our post factory to create some dummy records in our database. I'll just create 10 dummy records for now. Next, we'll need to make a HTTP request to our app. And Laravel makes it extremely easy for us to do that. We can call the JSON helper function to send a HTTP request with the appropriate request headers. The first argument is the request method. In our case, it will be a get method. And the second argument is the URL for our API endpoint which in our case here will be api slash v1 slash post. And our JSON helper function here will return us the HTTP response. And to assert a status, we can simply call a helper method called assert status on the response object. This will perform a test assertion to make sure that the response has a status code similar to what we provided in the argument, which in our case here, we want it to be 200. Other than status code assertion, Laravel also provides us a lot of other assertion helper method as you can see in the autocomplete drop down here. Okay, the last part of the test is to check whether the records returned inside the response match with our database records. To do that, first of all, let's look at what's inside the response body. Again, Laravel provides us a nice and convenient helper method for us to read the response body. We just need to call the JSON method on the response object and dump the result. Let's test our code. We'll go to our terminal and run PHP unit. Now, we created a few unit tests in a previous video, and by default, PHP unit will scan our test directory and run all the tests in it. And sometimes, instead of running all the tests, we just want to run a specific test to save time and resources. PHP unit allows us to run a specific test by supplying a flag code filter. In our case here, we only want to run post API test, so I'll supply dash dash filter equals to post API test. Hit enter and our test is running. Now here, we can see our dumb result from our response. And the main data lives inside the data key in the response. So we'll go back to our code and we'll create a variable called data that reads from the data key in a JSON response. Now the JSON helper function allow us to access key inside a response body using the dot notation. The dot notation is a special syntax that allows us to access data inside an array. So here we specify data as the argument of the JSON helper method, we are essentially accessing the data key in the response body. So now if we dump our data variable, go back to the terminal and run our test again, we're not only seeing the data payload in the response without the metadata. We can use the dot notation to access specific elements in the array. For example, if I want to access the element with index 19 here, I can simply put a dot right after the data key and put in 19. And that means we're accessing the number 19 element in the data key. And now go back to our terminal and run the test again. And we see the last element. Now, if we want to read the ID key in this element, I simply need to add an extra dot ID in the dot notation. Let's try again. And we see 20. Now, you might be wondering, we only created 10 records in the factory function. Why did our API endpoint return us 20 records? The reason is because every time we run a test, it will not start from scratch and PHP unit will not reset our database. So in order for us to clear the database before we start running the test, we can load the refresh database trait in our test class. So this trait will magically reset all the data before each test function runs. Let's try again. We'll go to our terminal and run our test.
And this time, we're only seeing nine indices in the response body. The downside of using the refresh database trait is that it could massively slow down our testing. So use it sparingly. A way to get around with this speed limitation is to use the in-memory SQLite as our database connection. To use the in-memory SQLite connection, we need to go to our PHP unit configuration file and uncomment our database connection environmental variable to instruct Laravel so that it will use the in-memory SQLite rather than our MySQL instance. And now let's go back to our test class and go to our terminal again, run a test, and bam, look at how fast it is. Isn't that neat? One thing to note here is that if you're using the in-memory SQLite connection, we always want to load the refresh database trait. Behind the scene, the trait will trigger the migration script and reset our database. If we don't use the trait, Laravel will throw us an error because the tables are not created in SQLite. Anyway, for now, we'll need to test if every post returned from the HTTP response is the same as the post that we created using the factory function. So what we can do here is to loop through the data and check if the ID of each record exists inside the post collection from the factory. So first of all, I want to map the post into an array of IDs to simplify our test. I'm using the arrow function here because we only need a simple one-liner function. And now to verify the records, I'll convert the data variable into a Laravel collection because collection has a nicer API compared to native PHP arrays. And I'll call the collection helper method each to loop through each item in the data variable. And for each item, we want to check if the ID of the post exists in our post IDs array. To do that, we can use the in array PHP array helper function. The in array helper function will return true if the needle is found in the haystack. The needle in our case here is the ID key in the post data item. And the haystack is our post IDs variable up there. So to perform the test, we need to make sure that the result of this in array function is true. We can simply call the assert true function for that. Okay, let's try to run our test. Whoops, we got an error. And the reason is the in array function can only accept an array as its argument, not a collection. Our post IDs variable is a collection. So we need to convert it into an array. And that is quite easy. We just need to call the two array helper method on it. Let's try again. And we see green in our result. Great, our tests are passing. All right, let's move on. The next endpoint that we want to test will be the show endpoint. Again, first thing first, we want to replicate the environment. In this case, we want to make sure that there's an existing dummy post in our database. So I'll use the factory function to create a dummy post. Step two, we want to send a get request to the show endpoint. Step three, assert the status and get the data in the response body. And lastly, we want to make sure that the ID field in the response result is the same as our dummy ID. Let's go to our terminal and run our test and we get green again. That means our show endpoint is working. The next endpoint that we want to test is the correct endpoint. First of all, we want to generate some dummy payload to include in the post request. The best way to do this is to use the make method on the post factory. This method will return us a post model instance without creating it inside the database. So the idea here is that we want to convert this dummy model into an array so we can attach it inside the post request body. And now let's try to send a post request. Again, we'll call the JSON method. The first argument will be the post method. Second argument will be our create API endpoint. And the third argument is the body of our post request, which in our case here, we'll convert dummy into an array. Next, we'll do the same as before. We'll assert the status. This time the status will be 201 because we have created a new resource. And we'll get the data from the response body. Once we got the data, we want to test if the post created has the same attribute as our dummy post. So to compare the API response against the dummy model, we'll need to loop through our result. And for each key in it, we will test if it is the same as our dummy model. But before we do that, we first need to standardize our result to make sure it has the same key as our dummy model. So to do that, we'll convert result into a collection and call the only method to only include the keys that we specified. And the keys will be the keys of the attribute of our dummy post. So now once we got our standardized result, we will loop through it and make sure each value 
exists inside our dummy model. So in each iteration, we'll call the assert same method, and for the expected value, we'll get the value from our dummy model, and the actual value will be the one inside our result. Okay, let's test our code. We get green again. Beautiful. Now if we go to our post controller, and inside the post repository, as we define in a create method, every time we create a new post, we will emit a post created event. Let's also test this behavior. Laravel makes it easy for us to test if an event is dispatched. To test this, we first need to call the fake method from the event facade. Calling this method will actually stop Laravel from dispatching any event whatsoever in the app. Laravel will instead capture this event and enable us to perform assertion on them. I'll show you what I mean. So after we have sent our API request, the post created event, in theory, should have been captured by Laravel at this point in time. So we can simply call another helper method from the event facade, which is called assert dispatched, and will pass in the event class name in it. This assertion function will only work if we have already called the fake method beforehand. All right, let's run our test, and we get green again. Okay, let's move on. Let's write our test function for the update endpoint. For the update test, first of all, we want an existing data in our database. So we're going to use the factory correct method to correct a dummy record. Our objective here is to update this dummy record. And to do so, we'll need some dummy field as our update payload. The easiest way to do this is to correct another dummy record by using the factory make method. And now to update our dummy post, we need to know what fields can we update. One way of doing this is to call the getFeelable method from a post instance. The getFeelable method will return us a feelable array as we define in our model. I'm converting it into a collection because collection is much more easier to work with compared to array. So the getFeelable array will essentially return the feelable property as we define in our post model. And now we want to try and update our dummy record with these feelables. So let's look through our feelables, and for each of them, we will send a patch request that updates our dummy record. So we'll call the JSON method again. Method name will be patch, URI will be slash API slash v1 slash post, and our dummy record post ID. For the request body, we will specify which field that we want to update. So the field name will be our to update variable, which is one of our feelables, and the value of it will get it from dummy2. Dummy2 has different values, and we want to test if dummy1 has the same value as dummy2 after the patch request. So after the patch request is made, we want to assert the status to be 200 and also get the data key from the response. Once we got the result, we can perform the assertion right away. So I'll call the assert same method. The expected will be the dummy2 value, and the actual value, we will get it from dummy1. Now since we have updated dummy1, we need to call the refresh method on our variable to get the latest model, because our variable here is still referring to the model before the update. Okay, let's run our test, and we get green again. Great! The update method will also emit a post update event. Let's also quickly test if our event is dispatched correctly or not. Again, we'll call the fake method on the event facade, and right after we send a patch request, we'll call the assert dispatch method and pass in our post updated event class. Run our test again. All green. And now we just need to write one more test and we're done. Let's test the delete endpoint. And the idea here is that we'll first correct a dummy record and send a delete request to delete this dummy model. And as usual, we want to test if the status code is 200. Now, after this, the database shouldn't have this record anymore. So if we try to query for this dummy record by using the find or fail method, we would expect an exception. So just before the query, we would call the expect exception method, and the exception that we would expect to draw would be model not found exception. Let's run our test, and it's working. Now the delete endpoint will also dispatch a post deleted event. Let's quickly test that as well. So I'll call the event fake method, and also event assert dispatched, and pass in post deleted. Let's run our test again, and it's all green. Getting green testing result is one of the most rewarding experience when it comes to writing tests. As long as you're writing good tests, you can rest assured that your app should work most of the time. 
there are still a lot of tests can be added to our test suite, especially set path testing to handle edge cases and catch potential bugs. Try to think of some other test scenario where you can improve the reliability of our test and let me know your ideas in the comments below. Now we still need to write our test for our users endpoint and comments endpoint. I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Again, the solution will be posted in the project repository. We'll learn more about testing as we continue in this series. And I'll share a few more tips in the upcoming videos. I'll see you there. Key takeaway for this lesson, providing the filter flag to PHP unit allow us to run a specific test. Calling the fake method from the event facade stops event from dispatching in our app. And it also allows us to capture and assert event dispatching. Laravel provides us a handy JSON method to test our API endpoints. That's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. Hey there, SM. So far, our current workflow of writing a test is to write our code and manually triggering PHP unit in our terminal. And this process can be quite tedious, especially when we got a million tests to write. Every time we finish writing a test, we have to go back to the terminal and rerun the test. It would be great if we got a way to automatically trigger PHP unit as soon as our code changes without us manually go to our terminal and rerun PHP unit. So the question is, is there a way to do this? And the answer is, hell yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making this video. So that's actually a PHP package called PHP unit watcher. And as the name suggests, it will watch changes in our code and run PHP unit whenever our code changes. I'll show you how it works. First of all, let's install it. We'll go to the package repository and look for the installation instruction. The link is in the description if you want to take a look at it yourself. We'll copy the installation command and paste it in our terminal to install the package. Notice the double dash dev flag here. We're installing this package as a dev dependency because we only need it for development purposes, not for production. All right, now that's done, let's see how we can use this package. Based on the documentation, we simply need to type in PHP unit watcher watch in our terminal. Let's try this out. The PHP unit watcher binary is living inside the vendor folder, the bin directory. This binary file should be automatically added by the package once the installation is completed. If you don't see this binary, that means you have an issue with the installation and you should reinstall the package. Okay, now once we located the binary, we can simply type in the watch command right after it. And bam, PHP unit watcher is now running and it is watching our source code. But somehow I've got lots of errors here. Let's pretend they are not there. We'll come back to it later. For now, I just want to show you that PHP unit will be rerun by PHP unit watcher whenever our source code changes. So I'll type in T to filter out our test and I'll type in our example test here just for demonstration. And now I'll go back to our code and add another line of some stupid assertion, go back to our terminal and PHP unit has now been re-triggered. So we can see there are five assertions. Four of the assertions are from our example test here which is part of the unit test. And the other one assertion is from the example test counterpart in the feature testing folder. Great. So that's how PHP unit watcher would work and save us time by rerunning PHP unit automatically. And now it's time to fix the error in our test. Let's rerun PHP unit watcher. We've got 10 errors. Let's see what does the last error says. The error was thrown in the user repository and it says that we're missing the user's table. Let's go to our user repository test. Hmm, seems like the error exists because we did not use the refresh database trait. If the refresh database trait is not loaded, that means Laravel will not perform the migration and therefore our user table will not be created. So let's load our refresh database trait and go back to our terminal and PHP unit is already triggering. Boom, we're down to seven errors instead of 10. The next error is in the post repository, and I suspect it's the same issue. Let's go to our post repository test and load the refresh database trait. Back in our terminal, we're down to four errors. The next one is in the comment repository, and we will do the same. And back to our terminal, we get green now. Beautiful. And that's a quick summary on PHP Unit Watcher. I hope my little error fixing demonstration here can help you to see the value of PHP Unit Watcher. It's really convenient and time saving. And trust me, it will save you a lot of hours and makes you a happier developer. PHP Unit Watcher provides you a lot of way to configure it. Feel free to have a look at the documentation and see how you can customize it. And let me know your tips and tricks down in the comment section below. Okay, 
Key takeaways for this lesson. PHP Unit Watcher is a wonderful package that automatically rerun our tests whenever there's a change in our source code. It is a great tool that will save us lots of times and make us happier in the long run. That's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. Hey there, Sam. Now, if you look at the Composer JSON file, there's an interesting field here called scripts. In a nutshell, Composer scripts are helper command shorthands that allow us to execute long commands by using Composer. We can run any command that we want. As you can see here, Laravel has already provided us a few scripts out of the box. I'll show you how it works. Let's create a dummy script. I'll call it playground, and the value will be an array of command. Now, just for demonstration, I'll simply type in an ls command, which will just list all the directories in my current folder. And now, if we go to our terminal to run our playground script, I'll simply type in composer run script and our script name, which is playground. Hit enter. And we see our ls command got executed, and we see a list of files and directories. Now, if we want to run another command right after our ls command, we just need to pass in a second element to our array. For example, let's say I want to echo some silly things right after the ls command, something like echo hey yeah yeah yeah, and back to our terminal, run composer run script again, and now we see our echo run right after the ls command. So Composer will execute the scripts that we provided in the array one by one. So can you see the benefits of using the scripts? We can put in long and complex command inside a script and label them with an easy to remember shorthand so we can easily execute them next time. If you are a JavaScript developer, this works exactly like NPM scripts. Okay, now let me show you a few quick scenarios on why this could benefit us in our project. Every time we want to run PHP unit, we first need to awkwardly locate the binary of PHP unit and then run it. Now, instead of doing that, what we can do is to wrap this command into a composer script. I'll call the script name test. And since we're only executing one command, we don't need an array this time. We'll just simply run the binary of PHP unit. Let's go back to our terminal and type in composer run script test. And it works. So the next time when we want to run our test, we don't need to locate the binary of our PHP unit anymore. Now, here's another issue though. Sometimes we want to pass arguments to the underlying command in our script. For example, I would like to pass a filter flag to PHP unit. If I do that as it is now, it will not work. To resolve this, we need to pass in an additional double dash right after our script. After the additional double dash, we can pass in any arguments to the underlying command as usual. Let's hit enter, and the filter flag is now working. Another example, let's also create a helper script to run PHP unit watcher. I'll call the script name test colon watch, and the value is simply a path to the binary. And now let's go back to our terminal and run our script. Whoops, I made a mistake. I forgot to add the watch option. Let's try again. And it's now working. Beautiful. So you can pretty much write anything you like for composer script. In some of my past projects, I have added a script called deploy, which is a nice and simple way to deploy my app to the production server. The actual deployment script is very complicated, and I don't want to run the whole thing every time I want to deploy my app. So I just simply create a composer script that will trigger the whole deployment process for me. All right, that's it. If you want to learn more about composer script, feel free to visit the documentation. Again, the link is in the description. Key takeaway for this lesson, Composer scripts are handy shorthands that allow us to define and run complex commands. If we want to pass arguments to our scripts, we need to supply an additional double dash after the script name. That's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. Hey there, Sam. In programming, there's a development style called test-driven development, TDD for short. In simple terms, it means to write our test before we write our code. So the idea of TDD is that it forces us to think about how our app will behave before we even start coding. Once we define all the expectation and behavior in our test, then we'll start writing our code and make our test pass. If all of our tests passed, that means our code satisfies our expected behavior and therefore the code should work. TDD has a long history now, and it is a good way to write code as it has enormously reduced the numbers of bugs in large enterprise apps. So there are a lot of big companies out there really put a heavy emphasis on TDD. I'll show you a quick example on how TDD would look like in practice. Now suppose in our app, we need to perform a few arithmetic operations, such as adding, multiplying, and subtracting numbers. 
Let's create an aromatic helper class for that. I'll create a new folder called math in the helper directory. And in there, I'll create a new class called aromatic helper. So in the class, we'll add a few math functions such as add and minus. And from here on is where the TDD fun begins. We should stop writing our code at this point and start writing our test. So let's create a test for the aromatic helper. I'll go to the unit test directory and create a new test class. And because I'm lazy, I'll simply copy and paste the example test class and rename it to aromatic helper test. Once we're done, let's start testing our add function. We need to think about what sort of behavior will the add function have. Again, there are two types of testing, the happy path testing and the sad path testing. So for the happy path testing, I'll start with the most obvious behavior, which is to test if we can add numbers together. Now, when I'm writing tests for TDD, I like to first write down all my test cases before I start writing the test code. Some people prefer to write the test code directly after they define the test case, but that's not me because I know my brain is limited and I can be forgetful. I would much prefer to write down all the test cases at once so I don't need to think about what test to write later on. The test cases that I listed here also serve like a to-do list for us to complete this test class. All right, let's keep going. For the second happy path test, we would test if the add function would take in multiple arguments. Now for the set path, I will test if the add function can only take in numeric arguments. So if we try to fit it non-numeric arguments, such as array or string, it would throw us an error. And our add function should also accept at least one argument. If the user did not pass in any argument to it, it should throw us an error. All right, I think that's enough. Let's start writing our test code. First thing first, we'll run our PHP unit watcher. So PHP unit will run our code while we're writing our test. So let's go to our terminal and we'll run the composer script that we defined in the previous lesson. We just need to run the aromatic helper test, so I'll pass in a filter argument. Okay, it's now up and running. We'll go back to our test and start writing our test code. So for the first test, we'll first set up the environment to run our code, which is to set up two numbers. And we'll define our source of truth, that is the sum of both numbers that we just defined. Then we'll run our add function and pass in num1 and num2. And finally, we'll assert the result. It won't work at the moment. As you can see here in the terminal, our test is failing because we haven't implemented the logic in our add function. So let's start doing that. The typical TDD approach would be writing the minimal code so that our test can pass. So let's go to our add function. Even though that I know the add function needs to take in an arbitrary numbers of arguments, but in order for us to pass the first test, I'll just make it to take in two arguments for now. And the add function will simply return num1 plus num2. And back to our terminal, we can see that our test is now passing. And now we move on to the next test. This time we want to test if our add function can take in multiple arguments. And logically, we know that our code at the moment will not be able to handle this because we have only written the bare minimum to let the first test pass. But that's the principle of TDD and we have to see through it. For now, let's write the code for the second test. I'll copy the setup from our first test and add a new number. And now going back to our terminal, as expected, our test has failed. So let's go to our add function and refactor our code. To make our function takes in an arbitrary numbers of argument, we can use a splat operator, which is a triple dot. So the triple dot operator will pack all the arguments into an array. What we need to do in the function body here is to loop through this array. And for each loop, we'll add a number to the sum and return the sum at the end of the function. So this code here should do the trick. We'll go back to our terminal and we're not seeing any error, which is great. And again, that is the development style of TDD. We're trying to pass one test at a time and constantly refactoring our code. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the typical TDD approach. That is to write code just to pass one test at a time. To me, it is not very productive since we need to constantly refactor our code. What I do instead is to look at all the tests and implement the code in one go. So for the rest of the two tests, we need to put in validation that checks for numeric arguments and also a minimum of one argument. Let's write our test code. So if we try to pass in data type other than number to our add function, we would expect an error. We need to call the expect exception method to run this test. 
we would expect an invalid argument exception. We have multiple data types to test here. We have strings, array, now, boolean, and function. Let's move these guys into their own test case, because ideally, one unit test should only test for one thing. Now that we have finished writing our test code, let's go back to our terminal and we see failures as expected. So let's go to our add function and we'll add a check to check for the type of the number inside the for loop. If the number is not a float or an integer, then we'll throw the invalid argument exception. Once we're done, go back to our terminal and our tests are now passing. Great. And while we're in here, Let's also implement the check to see there's a minimum of one argument. If that's not, we'll throw another invalid argument exception. Let's go back to our test. For our last test, again, we'll expect the invalid argument exception and we'll simply call our add function without passing in any arguments. And go back to our terminal and we now see green. Great. And that is a quick introduction to TDD. Although our example here, is quite trivial, but it demonstrates the process of TDD, and I hope that it gives you a better idea on how TDD looks like. We still have the minus method to test on. I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Again, just a personal opinion before we end the lesson. The standard process of TDD can be time consuming, and sometimes they can be quite distracting. I tend to define the test function first, then I write my code logic, and then the test code. It works great for me, but it might not be suitable for you. So feel free to find your own way to write tests. Key takeaway for this lesson, test-driven development, or TDD for short, is the idea of writing tests first and write the code later. In standard TDD, we would write the bare minimum code to pass our test and refactor our code as we progress to the more advanced tests. That's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. Hey there, Sam. So in the previous video, we learned about testing, and there are generally three types of tests. Unit testing, feature testing, and end-to-end -end testing. However, here's a question for you. How much testing is considered as enough? As a developer, it's very easy for us to fall into the trap where we want to test every single thing in our app or test all kinds of user behavior in an attempt to catch potential bugs before our code is shipped to the production. Now, that's actually a term in testing which is known as code coverage. And it simply refers to the percentage of the functions in our app that have been tested. 100% means that every single function is fully tested, and 0% means nothing is tested. Realistically speaking, for most projects, aiming for 100% code coverage is very, very difficult. The reason is because developers are very expensive. 100% code coverage means that the development team has to spend a lot of time writing tests, and the company has to pay for that. You see, a lot of business people think differently than developers. To developers, Testing can really help to reduce bugs and be able to ship a robust app and also reduce a lot of maintenance work in the long run. However, to a business person, writing tests is not productive since we're not introducing a new feature to the app. In other words, writing tests does not bring any economic value to them. Think about this. Have you ever heard a salesperson tells you our product has 100% code coverage and we have written a lot of unit tests to make sure that our software is working correctly? Very unlikely, right? If your answer is yes, leave a comment below and tell us the story. I would like to hear more about that. In contrast, you're more likely to hear about the app features rather than unit testing in a sales pitch. To a customer who is paying for the product, a bug-free app is a given. That's why hearing about the 100% code coverage does not bring any value to the table. And that's the reason why you'll hear a lot of stories about stakeholders and developers fighting against each other. A lot of projects has very limited budget and simply do not have the time to write any test. I strongly discourage shipping code without writing any test because it is like walking on a street naked. As a general rule of thumb, a good project would have 60 to 80% of code coverage. Again, this number is just a rough estimate. It really depends on what type of projects you have. On a mission critical project, for example, a finance app that processes thousands of transactions per day, or a healthcare app that runs in a busy hospital, where a simple box could cost a patient's life. In this kind of app, we need to make sure that our code does not fail in production. 
and that means 100% code coverage is a very reasonable request. On the other hand, if you're just building a simple static website, writing tests becomes optional. So my advice here, to answer my original question, how much test is enough for a project, I would say you need to find a good balance and think about the budget of the app. The more tests that you can write, the better it is. Writing a little bit of test is better than writing none. And now, given that we have limited budget, which type of test should we focus on? End-to-end -end testing, feature testing, or unit testing? Now, before we answer this question, I want you to spend a few moments to take a look at these few examples. These are the perfect example of someone who only focuses on unit testing. Don't get me wrong, unit testing is important, but making sure that our feature would work correctly is equally important. In the previous lesson, we talked about the reliability and the difficulty of implementing these three types of tests, with end-to-end -end testing being the most reliable, but the most difficult to write. Unit testing is the easiest and the quickest, but not very reliable. What I want to point out here is that if your project has a budget issue, I would prefer writing end-to-end -end testing and feature testing over unit testing, focusing on testing interface rather than the implementation details. And that's exactly the point of feature testing. Don't sweat the details, but to look at the overall picture. If everything works on a high level, we can assume that the internal implementation is working correctly. And one last question before we end this video. How much time should we spend on writing tests? If you remember from the last video, we did a demo on testing some mathematical functions. The add function that we're testing is only about 15 lines of code, but the test for it is a massive 17 lines of code, which is around four to five times. To answer this question, again, my advice is to find a good balance on spending time writing tests. The standard TDD approach is time consuming by nature, although it'll save you a lot of maintenance time in the long run. If the project has limited budget, then I would say to only use TDD on features rather than every single unit of functions. And just for your reference, on average, I spend about 30 to 50% of the project time writing tests. And again, depending on the nature of the project, this number can change. Okay, that's enough of me talking. Again, the purpose of this video is just to share my opinion on the topic of testing in the real world. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'll be happy to hear about them. That's it for now, and I'll see you again in the next video. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for the support.